Number 402. 
And we are so very thankful. Father God, every time we go outside and we look at these beautiful mountains and we see the trees and the changing of the leaves and we see the, the brilliant blue sky and the sunshine and the rain, Father, it, it is but a small glimpse of what the eternity will be and how beautiful it will be in heaven. We can't even imagine. Father God, this beautiful river valley in which we are privileged to live thrills us as we go out into the crisp air and we enjoy how clean everything is this time of the year. We realize the seasons are changing and it reminds us of the coming winter. But after the the death of the winter, we are inspired by this, the renewal of the spring and the warmth of the sun in the summer and this great circle that goes on, Father, in this place where you have placed us, how perfect it is, all in accordance with your will. And when we think of these things, Father, it reminds us, it reminds us of you, it reminds us of the, how much you love us. How much you care for us that you've given us a beautiful place to live. When we're gathered here together and we enjoy the prosperity of this great nation, we realize how blessed we are. Help us, Father, to always remember that we have an opportunity here in this country that many in other parts of the world do not have. Father God, we're, we're blessed materially in this country. And there are so many in this world who are not. Matter of fact, we, Father, are so blessed that sometimes we take the things that we have for granted. And we forget that they are gifts from you. And we forget that your Son, Jesus Christ, gave up heaven. He gave up being you. He gave up so many things to come and live upon this earth as one of us. So that he could be the perfect sacrifice for our sins, Father. The opportunity that we have to remember that sacrifice for the cross today, every time we think upon that cross, we need to remember love. And that we are to share this love with others, with one another. But especially we're supposed to share this love with those who are lost, those who are without hope, those who do not understand who you are and what you've done for us. Help us to love so much that we are willing to give of ourselves. And not just of our money, but of ourselves and of our time. And of our opportunities that we have. Every moment of our life, Father, you have told us we are to walk in the light. Help us to be that light that is shining upon the hill for others to see your glory reflected in us. Thank you so much, Father, for our opportunities to give a day to do a little bit for this congregation and helping the elders and the deacons to proclaim the word not only in this community but throughout the world. Father God, we're so thank you for your son Jesus Christ and that sacrifice and that love that you have for us. So I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Number 309. This morning we'll sing the first verse of this song, prayer of mind, which is like the supper this morning. Number 309. <laughs>
are going to be Abraham's seed, we are going to be people of faith like Abraham was. But sometimes we don't always know all the story about his faith. So let's consider that this morning. Number one, and this may be the most surprising point, Abraham chose to believe in God. Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. Your father, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. <coughs> Abraham didn't grow up in a monotheistic home. Now, Terah may have served God, but he served other gods as well. And so, definitely he was polytheistic. And so, Abraham made a choice. He chose, I'm going to believe in Yahweh. I'm going to believe in the real and true God. And that's exactly what the Bible says about him. Genesis 15 and verse 6. And he believed in the Lord. But secondly, not only did Abraham choose to believe in God, he chose to believe God. Genesis 12 verse 2. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. And here are the blessings that God gave to Abraham. That he would have children at a time when he had no child. That his descendants would be like the stars of the heavens and the sand of the seashore. Again, when there were no descendants. That his descendants would one day come back and inherit the land in which he was wandering in. Again, no descendants. He had no inheritance except a burial place for his wife, and yet he believed God. And when he finally had that son, and God asked him to offer that son, he believed that God would raise that son. why Abraham's faith is held up to us as a model of belief. Hebrews 11 verse 8 tells us about Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of a place that he would afterward receive as an inheritance. So he believed God and he moved a lot. And that brings us to the third point of Abraham's faith. He didn't just believe God. He acted upon that belief. So Genesis 12, 4 tells us Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Now, I think I've said this before, but it bears repeating again. If I came home one day and said, Connie, we're moving. And she said, where? And I said, I don't know. We're just going to be. I can guarantee you not one dish is going to be wrapped. There are going to be no boxes put out. And there are going to be no plans made until she knows where, why, when, and so on. But Abraham did that. Abraham picked up, left one of those modern regions on earth and wandered about the rest of his life simply because God said to do so. James 2.21 tells us then, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? And so, God told Abraham certain things. And Abraham believed and acted upon those sons. Picking up and moving and wandering in the land, taking his son a promise, and going so far as to having the knife raised in his hand to take Isaac's 
life. And so Paul holds this man Abraham up as a model for us. So as we look at him, number one, it is important that you and I choose to believe in God. There are a lot of gods out there attracting the world's attention, and I don't just mean things that people build idols out of. Money, possessions, wealth, fame, fortune, all of these things can become idols to individuals. And so we have to choose to believe that, yes, there really is one true living God, and we're going to accept that fact. And we're going to believe in Him. But then once we believe in Him, like Abraham, we have to believe Him. God's made a lot of promises. He's promised us that if we obey Him, we have an opportunity to spend eternity with Him. Now, Abraham had some pretty neat promises. But yeah. the opportunity to be in the place that Jesus has gone to prepare for those who love Him, wow. The promises that God made to Abraham are pale compared to that. Pale indeed compared to that. But like Abraham, it's not enough just to believe in God and believe God. We too have to act on that faith. Jesus told the people of His day in John 8, verse 39, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Okay? Paul says we're children of Abraham by faith. And if we're Christ, we're Abraham's seed. And so this statement <coughs> is really a statement to us. If you're Abraham's seed, you will do the things Abraham did. You will dedicate your life to God. You will live your life in obedience to God. You will follow the pathway that God wants you to. And we need to remember something James told us in chapter 2, verse 17. He says, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now the actual word is dead means lifeless. You know, we say we have all kinds of faith. We tell people we have the greatest faith in the world, but if we do not move, because of that faith. If we do not act upon that faith, if we do not live by that faith, it's actually a very shallow and hollow faith. Faith is not a passive principle in the lives of Christians. Faith is an active, dynamic thing that causes us to pick up and do what God wants us to do. And so as we think about obeying like Abraham obeyed, there are two broad areas in which you and I need to obey. First is as we look at the gospel and we are taught the gospel, we need to obey it. Paul wrote in Romans 1 in verse 5, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship, notice why. For the obedience to the faith among all nations. What's the faith? Well, Paul said he was not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation. Romans 1 6 faith. The faith that he is talking about is the faith that is generated by hearing the gospel message. We respond to that. Jesus came and lived and sacrificed Himself that we might live. But the Gospel calls upon us to act upon that belief. Jude verse 3 tells us to earnestly contend for the faith 
which was once for all delivered to the saints. And that's what we must do. Stand up for the gospel. Stand up for what the Word teaches us about Jesus. Stand up for how we are supposed to live. But Peter tells us something in 1 Peter 1, 22. He says, since you have purified your soul in obeying the truth. It's not enough to hear about Jesus. It's not enough to know Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We must do what Jesus said do to have His sacrifice come into effect for us. Because He's giving the great commission to His disciples. He said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. This is Jesus teaching me. We believe and we act upon that belief by obeying God by being baptized. And as we read Romans 6, 1 through 4, we find out there's a very important purpose in that. By our being baptized into Christ, in a very real sense of the word, we recreate in ourselves the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so in Instead of baptism being something we can kind of take or leave, it actually becomes a very vital symbol and a very vital action on our part that we are accepting Christ's death on the cross. We are allowing Christ's blood to wash us from our sins and we are going to live a new life in Him. Now, I don't just believe that. We must act upon it. But, once we act upon that, obedience doesn't end there. Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 2, and verse 12, and he said, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. You don't stop obeying the gospel and the teachings of the New Testament simply because we become Christian. Actually, that's that walking in newness of life that Paul spoke of in Romans 6, 4. We're obeying the truth. We're doing what God says. Now, let's think on this very practically for a minute. When we ran our lives, we messed them up. When we run our lives, we enter sin, we fall away from God, we are separated from Him, we are lost. So it's obvious we can't do it. You know, Jeremiah even made the statement, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man, not in himself, it's not in man that walks to direct his own step. We can't get the job done. And so Jesus and his apostles came along and taught us the way to get the job done. Not always easy. Sometimes it may be quite different. And yet, if we live lives of obedience to Christ as Christians, we have a promise. Hebrews 5, 9, And being made perfect, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all those who obey Him. So if we obey Christ in obeying the Gospel, and we live life of obedience to Him, and following His teachings day by day, He's made a problem. We can have eternal life. We can be heirs of Him. Now, some years after Paul wrote Galatians, he's going to write another statement in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7. He's going to say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept. So I want to ask you a question. Are you keeping the faith? First off, have you obeyed the faith? Have you believed in Jesus with all of your heart? Have you repented of your sins and confessed your name, His name? Have you washed away your sins in the waters of baptism? No, you've not yet obeyed the faith. 
And then, if you have obeyed the faith, have you been living obediently to that life day by day? Or have you turned? Have you gone back into the world? And if so, do you need to come back? Repent of your wrong and ask God. <coughs> Abraham's faith is an active, living, dynamic faith. And that's the kind of faith that you and I need to have. And if you need to act on